Embryological terms can be quite confusing, and my students sometimes struggle with distinguishing among the terms agenesis, aplasia, and hypoplasia. I have a previous video on terminology that broadly defines these three terms, but today's tutorial specifically compares and contrasts them using some examples of congenital abnormalities. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, a histology wizard. Now there are two key points to remember today. First, the terms agenesis, aplasia, and hypoplasia reflect varying severities of developmental arrest of an organ or structure. And second, the earlier in development that an arrest occurs, the more severe the defect and the less functional the organ is. So you can think of these terms on a spectrum with agenesis having the worst and most severe defects and hypoplasia the least. Let's start with agenesis, which is complete absence of the organ or structure. Now, normally, an organ or tissue develops from a primordium or a seed, just like a flower grows from a seed. In Greek, a means not or no, and genesis means the origin. So agenesis means a lack of primordium or a lack of an origin. And typically, this means we won't see any evidence of that organ in the adult. Next up, aplasia. Now, aplasia is the failure of an organ to develop past the earliest stages. So again, a means not, and plasis means formation. So again, no formation. But unlike agenesis, the primordium, or in this case the seed, is actually there. But there's some kind of defect in the process. So development begins, but it arrests for some reason at very early stages. Now, hypoplasia is related to aplasia. It's the incomplete development or underdevelopment of an organ or tissue. So again, plasia means formation and hypo means below or less than normal. So a less than normal formation. You can almost consider aplasia a severe form of hypoplasia. Now, hypoplasia is also caused by a defect somewhere in the growth process from primordium to structure. That primordial tissue is present it might be smaller, but there's an incomplete organ or structural development. End result is that the adult organ or tissue is smaller. Now let's look at two examples. We're gonna look at the urinary system or the kidneys and the pulmonary system, and we'll start with the kidney. So recall that normally we have bilateral kidneys and each one has a corresponding ureter that inserts into the bladder. In kidney agenesis, both the kidney and ureter are absent. So this can be on one or both sides. In this CT scan, we see only a single kidney. Now, one hypothesis for how this happens is that there is an early vascular insult to the developing ureteric bud, but this is just a hypothesis. Now, because this is such an early developmental arrest, many agenesis syndromes are frequently associated with other congenital abnormalities. In renal agenesis, in the absence of one or both kidneys, the ureters can be absent, and the sex organs may also be abnormal, because as you'll remember, the urinary and genital systems share a common embryonic origin. They arise from intermediate mesoderm. Now, in addition, the job of the fetal kidneys is to produce urine, and that makes up most of, am of the amniotic fluid. And we know that insufficient amniotic fluid, called oligohydramnios, can be caused by kidney agenesis, and this can cause lung hypoplasia and other abnormalities. Next up, we have an example of aplasia. Now here you can see some development of kidney parenchyma, those little brown dots, and ureter structure, but this kidney is not functional. And it actually turns out that it's hard to tell the difference between renal agenesis and aplasia during the newborn period. And so most of these get classified as agenesis by default. However, there have been a lot of really interesting studies recently that use ultrasound in neonates where they track the kidneys in the neonatal period and then through the newborn period. And what they found is that there are aplastic kidneys that regress in the newborn period. And so this suggests that renal agenesis or most cases of renal agenesis that are diagnosed clinically might actually be renal aplasia in which we have a primordium and a little bit of development but then regression. Now, in any event, clinically, the end result is the same, this lack of a kidney, and it's called congenital solitary kidney. Now, in kidney hypoplasia, 
there's variable development of the kidney parenchyma and ureter structure. So this kidney can be functional, but it's just reduced in size. In the case here, we're looking at a CT scan where we see a small kidney, but it pretty much has normal proportions. And in fact, this was found incidentally with imaging. Now for our second example, let's take a look at lung agenesis, aplasia, and hypoplasia, and we're going to use chest x-rays. First, we need to review what a normal chest x-ray looks like. So here, the patient's right side appears on the left in this image as we're looking at it. And structures that are dense, such as bone, block most of the x-ray particles, and so they appear white. Metal and contrast media, or dyes that are used to highlight areas of the body, also appear white. Muscle, fat, and fluid can appear as different shades of gray. And structures that contain air, such as the stomach, usually appear as black. So if we look within the chest cavity here, we see the heart and the ribs in white and the lungs in the pleural cavity are black. So first we'll look at an example of pulmonary agenesis. And this is where the bronchial tree, the pulmonary parenchyma and the pulmonary vasculature don't develop. On this chest x-ray, the right lung appears white instead of black compared to the left. So in this case, we probably have, form well, we know we have formation of the gut tube, we have the respiratory diverticulum, which is that primordium of the lung, and it forms, but the bronchial bud most likely has failed to develop on the right side, or the primordium hasn't formed at all. In either event, this is a very early developmental arrest. Now, lung agenesis can be an isolated finding, but in many cases, it's associated with other congenital malformations including those in the urogenital, vertebral, cardiac, and gastrointestinal systems. Next up, we have an example of pulmonary aplasia. Now here, again, where we should see the black of the lung, we see white on this left side, showing a reduced lung volume on that side. Now, a follow-up CT scan would most likely reveal a rudimentary bronchial pouch, but a significant decrease in lung parenchyma and pulmonary vasculature on that left side. Now, often the lung on the other side will show hyperinflation to compensate for reduced lung volume. Now, in this case, there was a respiratory diverticulum, some development, but since we see few other structures forming, again, this is likely to be an arrest very early on in the embryonic phase of lung development between four and six weeks. Now, one hypothesis is that this kind of early arrest is caused by abnormal blood flow in the dorsal aortic arch, and that happens at about week four to five. Now, pulmonary aplasia is most often unilateral since bilateral pulmonary aplasia or even hyperplasia is usually non-viable. And pulmonary aplasia will usually present with neonatal respiratory distress. So finally, let's look at an example of pulmonary hyperplasia. Here again, we see white on this chest x-ray on the left, indicating a lung volume loss. And a CT scan would most likely reveal a bronchus and some kind of rudimentary lung. There can be highly variable amounts of pulmonary parenchyma, but there's always a decrease in the number of lung cells, in the airways, the alveoli, and the pulmonary vasculature. In hypoplasia, we'll see formation of the respiratory diverticulum, bronchial budding, and some branching morphogenesis, but there's a variable amount of development after that. And so developmental arrest can occur at any of the different stages of lung development. Interestingly, most cases of pulmonary hypoplasia are secondary to other congenital anomalies or pregnancy complications. So with these secondary causes, hypoplasia usually results from factors directly or indirectly that compromising the thoracic space. So there's not enough space available for lung growth. So this can occur with something like kidney agenesis that we just talked about, where we have a reduced amount of amniotic fluid, or it can occur with something like congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which is where the intestines will actually move into the developing pleural cavity, and that reduces the amount of space for the developing lung. Pulmonary hypoplasia is often diagnosed in infants, but it also can be found incidentally in adults. I hope that this tutorial has helped clarify the distinctions between agenesis, aplasia, and hypoplasia. Thanks for stopping by.